recording, so you can remind folks that this is available um, after it's recorded on the Race Center website. So thank you everyone for making it. I'm Leah. I think everybody here oh, knows me. <laughs> and this is Bob Cottrell. He's coming um, through New Hampshire Humanities to Go grant. Um, they do a great speaker program. And um, I found Bob and his topic and thought, I suspect there's some folks in Waterville Valley who might be interested to hear a little bit about our state dog, including myself. So Bob, I'll let you introduce yourself and um, thank you so much for being here. And we're looking forward to it. Thanks. So I'll start off with a quiz. <laughs> How, raise your hand if you knew that the Chinook was the New Hampshire state dog. Okay. <laughs> there are actually um, very few states that have state dog, and of those state dogs, very few, even fewer of them, are actually born and raised in the United States, or the town or the state that they represent. So we have uh, this dog here. His great 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 grand Peppy was born in Wanalancet, a little village in Tamworth. How many of you ever been over to Tamworth or Wanalancet? Yeah. Okay. How many of you have seen the sled dog races over there? No? no. Oh, man. Um, I'll talk a little bit about it, but uh, fe uh, well, we're still working on the exact date. It'll either be the February 11th or February 18th. We're gonna be having um, our regular sled dog races in Wanalancet and um, they've been going on for many, many years, as you will find out. So um, how many of you have a dog? Raise your hand if you have a dog. <laughs> oh, only a few of you. Okay, well, we will well, have... How many of us would like it? I was going to say, we will, have, <laughs> we will have Chinook puppies at the February event, Aww. and they'll be available. Um, and I'll just, I'll just give you a, a, a real jump ahead that... Um, while they are very um, powerful uh, and uh, very um, good sled dogs, they are also, unlike a lot of sled dogs, they are very good family dogs. And um, so with that in mind, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, program's called Harnessing History on the Trail of New Hampshire State Dog. And this is the signs if you go to uh, Tamworth, Tamworth Village, and drive up along um, uh, 113A, then uh, you'll see these signs, the Chinook Trail that leads you to some of the important spots that were up there. Um, uh, first, we have to have a word from our sponsors. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, now, I'm only going to tell you, I've done a lot of research, and there have been a lot of uh, stories that people say, and um, what do you call it, like, uh, according to legend or whatever. So I will, I will make sure I say, according to legend, this is what I heard. Um, but what I'm going to tell you is absolutely uh, historically accurate uh, with, um, who's that guy in the sled? <laughs> who's in the sled? <laughs> Curious George. Curious George, yes, this is, this is when Curious George saved the man in the yellow hat with his sled dog team. And uh, you can actually find this on YouTube. You, have you seen it? I, I'm sure that we saw it. <laughs> actually, the New Hampshire Humanities Program that does over four, 400 uh, different programs a year um, on all kinds of subjects, and it's just amazing. And I also work at the History Room of the Conway Public Library. Now, do you guys have a library here in, in Waterloo? Of course. Of course. And do you have a, oh, you involved in it? Okay, and do you have a uh, history section? We do. Local history? Okay. So we, we, this is what we do. And uh, unlike a lot of towns that cover just the town history, um, we have been um, provided some funds by the Henny family. And believe it or not, they were genealogists. And people in Conway actually went across the main border and married people in Freiburg. And so they have a broader concept and they actually cover we actually cover all of uh carroll county and the white mountains and western oxford county maine which actually takes us all the way up to uh canadian border and we also do a lot of canadian um genealogy as well 
So if you're interested in any of that, let me know. Uh, so a lot of my job is doing gene genealogical research, family history, stuff like that. And I've done research on uh, presidential descendants. The Grover Cleveland family had a summer place in Tamworth. And uh, the very interestingly, I, I've done a whole blog on this. Um, I'm gonna be doing more research on it. Um, unlike the Washington Monument or Jefferson Memorial, his presidential memorial is a stone wall. And it is so fascinating because he had a little old dirt road that went up to his summer house and people got together and after he passed away and they made a straight road with a stone wall and it's the Grover Cleveland Memorial Wall. But by far, oh, I've also did, um, there was this guy that was a Red Sox player and then he did like the worst thing you could imagine. He went to the New York Yankees. And, uh, you know, I, actually, I live in Freedom, New Hampshire, and I work in Conway, New Hampshire. I go through Eaton, New Hampshire, back and forth. And when, um, when Babe Ruth would summer there, and his daughter owned a, um, an inn, they, um, he would play with the local teams. And so uh, he would play with the Eaton team. And the name of the Eaton team, have them close their ears, were the Eaton Boogers. <laughs> so Babe Ruth actually played on the Eaton Boogers. <laughs> and they have a barbecue sandwich that's named the Eaton Booger Burger. <laughs> if you ever go there, be sure to stop. <laughs> uh, community leaders, European royalty, the first person to bring a Christmas tree to Conway, New Hampshire, was Lady Blanche Murphy. And she was actually in line to become Queen of England. Now, she was something like 89th. <laughs> She'd have to kill 80, 88 other relatives off to become Queen. But she did, again, the worst thing you can imagine. I hope you young ladies don't do this. She married a musician. A church organist. Church organist. <laughs> um, and he was a commoner, so they kicked her out of the line of succession. But by far, the most distinguished, sophisticated, important client I've ever worked with doing family history, and also the best kisser, <laughs> was our dog Tug, our Chinook Tug. And uh, so we're going to follow his tail. You're welcome to laugh. <laughs> so uh, here he is. Uh, he was born in 2005, passed away in 2017. We're still looking. So these kids grew up. And I don't remember ever signing any document allowing him to do that, but they did. And so they moved away. So they were the ones who mostly took care of the dog. So, so we're, uh, the, the little boy there, he's moved back. Um, he was in Boston for a bunch of years. But um, so hopefully we'll be getting another dog, like I said. And he was adopted into a loving family, Red Sox fans, of course. And, uh, but like many other adopted children, he wondered about his parents and his ancestry. And we would go by the Chinook Cafe that used to be in Conway. And he'd say, am I going to grow up and look like that? And we'd say, you sure are. <laughs> and uh, this is the original picture of the great Chinook. And again, the Chinook Trail. Now, one of the things is if you do go up there, don't get confused. There's a place with a historic marker that says Chinook Kennels. But they never raised Chinooks at the Chinook Kennels. <laughs> So what we did is, uh, this is Tug, his parents, grandparents, great-grandparents, but we're also lucky to have the original pedigree from the great Chinook, and it might be a little hard to see, but let's see here. So this is the great Chinook, born January 17, 1917. And his uh, mom was a full-blooded Eastern Eskimo, or a Husky, um, daughter of Perry's uh, granddaughter of Perry's lead dog to the North Pole. Oh, wow. So this guy's great grandfather uh, went to the North Pole. And we'll find out later that he went to the South Pole. Uh, Kim says pedigree unknown. He was a mutt. <laughs> and uh, we didn't find out what he was until 2009. But through DNA research, we were able to find out. So the great Chinook was. Uh, bred out to Belgian Shepherd, German Shepherds, and so on and so forth, and created, um, you'll see in a, pic a picture in a minute, the genetics, the um, 
genotype and the phenotype, the way they looked, was so strong from, from the great Chinook that um, all of the future Chinooks look like them and act like them and so on and so forth. It's an amazing process. So we're gonna look at some questions. Why is Chinook New Hampshire state dog? What role did school kids have in making it the state dog? And why is that road called the Chinook Trail? And again, the historic markers where it shouldn't be. Okay, so it all started with Arthur Walden, born in Indianapolis, Indiana, 1871. And uh, I put here that Jack London was born um, five years later in San Francisco, California. You said you were from the West Coast? Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll try not to make too many jokes about that. <laughs> but uh, there's a little comparison between the two. They both wrote books and they both ran sled dogs. So uh, 24 years old, 1896, um, Arthur Walden was a son of a prominent Boston minister and he left, he was working at a farm in Wanalanza. Uh, he was a farm manager of Kate Sleeper's Wanalanza farm. And 24 year old, he went to Alaska to get gold. Jack London went to the Klondike um, the year later and he only stayed for nine months. You get this impression that Jack London was in Alaska forever. Well, Walden was there for six years, but London was only there for nine months. And he came back and he, he did a lot of different jobs and he wrote this book, um, Dog Puncher in the Yukon, what's what they called him. And what he did was he was a freight guy, a teamster. Um, they weren't, you know, doing races and all like that kind of stuff. So if you were a guy and you were young and you went to uh, San Francisco and you went up along the coast and you got off and you went up the Yukon River, you could only go so far as Circle City. And then you had to go overland for a couple hundred miles. And if you had the money, Walden would take your gear. So here you are going up the Yukon to Circle City, but the gold is over here in Dawson City in the Klondike. Two, over 200 miles. So then in uh, 1902, he came back and he married the boss's daughter. And uh, they all continued to operate the Wanalansa farm. And so Call of Wilds published 1903, White Fang. So it was kind of a really popular thing about sled dogs and popular imagination. And um, Walden, to bring people up those extra few miles from Tamworth Village um, or the train station at West Ossipee, he would, he thought, let's give dog sled rides. That would be really, really popular. And so he did. First team was uh, 1910, Rudyard Kippen Link. And I have no idea where he got the name from, but uh, they're B Bernie's Mountain Dogs. And he said, this is great. It's working. People love this. But if I had my own, he's kind of like P.T. Barnum. He said, if I had my own breed that nobody else had but me, this would become a popular gimmick. And so sure enough, Here's Kim and Ningo. So you can see Ningo on the right, uh, like a husky. And Kim it just looks like a mutt. And so they had these three guys out of a litter of, uh, what was it? Seven, out of liver seven. And uh, so kind of like the Native American experiences that Walden had up in Alaska and stuff, the idea is he called them uh, Ricky, Ticky, and Tabby. Again, I don't know where he gets these names. But uh, later on, he changed the names because Chinook was the one that was the calmest. And so Chinook means warm west wind in um, the uh, native language up there. And um, so he was like a, a gift. If you imagine um, the idea of um, suffering through the winter before you had market basket <laughs> and Dunkin' Donuts. I don't know how people survive. But um, you had to have all your food. And if it, mice got in it or anything like that, any problems, you know, you were really struggling by the end, by the spring. So Chinook is the first winds, warm winds that come and they say basically, hey, you might live another year. <laughs> you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna rain and we're gonna have some crops and so on and so forth. All righty. So again, we talk about um, Ningo from the North Pole, 
and Chinook going down to the South Pole. So we'll look at that in a second. So this is an interesting one, which again, kind of shows Chinook's behavior. So dad's in the front, Kim, then Ricky, renamed Chinook, Tiki and Tavi, and Tiki all excited. And, you know, it's kind of like you saw that um, show where the, um, it's about the old guy and he goes down uh, South America and anyway, his dog's like, squirrel, 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 <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and so, but Chinook, so he, his brother pulled his harness off, but Chinook's just like real cool, real calm. I'm not going to get excited. So he's a very dedicated, good dog. Um, Another dog that was popular during the time was this guy, Ren Tin Tin. Yeah. And uh, he actually uh, starred in 27 Hollywood films in 1929 and received most votes for Academy Award for Best Actor. <laughs> so in, in this social milieu, if you will, um, Walden wants to burst onto the scene. And by now, uh, 1922, he has uh, a whole bunch of little Chinooks and uh, the breeding has been very, very successful. And he goes to Berlin and he works with the brown paper company down there or up there and um they say he says let's have an international dog sled race the first international dog sled race in the lower 48 and uh there they are and look how all of the dogs look the same yeah they have those curly tails they have those big noses uh the ears are pinned and just you know it, it's just amazing that I mean, I don't know how that works, just like magic. So, those of you who live in New Hampshire know that you could basically throw a rock from Berlin and hit Canada. <laughs> but people in Toledo didn't, and San Francisco didn't. Boy, that West Coast. Uh, people in Mississippi didn't. And now they had, make sure you're seated and hold on to your seats. They had this thing back then. I can't even begin to imagine it. Where they put the news on paper and they called it <laughs> newspaper. And people used to buy it and read about exciting things. And what's more interesting than an international dog sled race? Now, on Walden won. And um, <laughs> it was only an afternoon. <laughs> And so he got himself on all of these papers. And it's cool because a lot of these are now online and you can just do, you know, Toledo Blade Chinook and you can say, yep, sure enough, there's a picture of Chinook and they covered the race. Um, so <clears throat> got real popular. And um, he also would open his uh, kennels up to visitors. And here's the great Chinook with a little girl and a dolly. And um, I gotta tell you, I almost cry every time I say this. So after one of my talks, a guy comes up, shows me this picture. He says, this was my mom. And uh, she has told me stories about meeting the great Chinook and how the great Chinook licked her dolly. <laughs> and then he said, would you like to meet her? And she was in the audience. She was 89 years old. And uh, she, she was crying and I was crying. <laughs> So here he is, uh, the gang at the 1922 Tamworth Winter Carnival, the first Winter Carnival. So he did all kinds of Winter Carnivals all over the state, all over New England. Uh, and this one says Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. But again, look how all the dogs just look like rubber stamp copies of each other. 1924, uh, the Waldens, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Walden started the New England Sled Dog Club. And that's the club that is the, you know, the official sponsor of the uh, races that we'll do in February and then we have the outing club and history center and all kinds of people and we used to do it on the lake um, but with the way the weather is we just haven't been able to be sure about that and so we have an exhibit at the museum and a um, bunch of different artifacts I've got some of them here and just look at that jacket so it's a leather fringe jacket and we'll see that a little later on but of course, the most fun part of the day is the Chinook meeting greet. So, um, and we also give dog sled rides for kids. Um, all right, so what else can you do to get your dog famous? Get him in the newspaper. And 1926, Chinook and Walden were the first to go up with dog team to the top of Mount Washington. And then he heard about going down to the South Pole and he thought this is gonna be great. Now he was 50 something at the time 
but um, he did arrange with Admiral Byrd to train the dogs and to um, set up the tents and everything. And this group here is interesting. They are known as the um, Three Musketeers. And um, Fred Crockett, Ed Goodell, and Norman Vaughn, and all of them have illustrious careers. You could do slideshow programs about them as well. Uh, Norman Vaughn particularly, I think he was in his 80s when he finally climbed the mountain um, uh, in Patagonia or wherever that uh, they named after him. Um, but it's, it, it is so funny. So they, they were going to a school in Boston and uh, they all dropped out and went up to Wanna Lancet to the um, Walden's farm and they said, we want to go to the South Pole with you. And he said, okay, that's fine. Um, where are you guys staying? He says, we don't know. He says, okay, sleep in the barn. He says, now, have you guys ever run dogs before? He says, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We've... None of them had ever touched it, <laughs> done it at all. Um, but they got really good. And one of the stories is that um, people would, would talk about how smart their dogs were that worked with these guys. Um, because they learned to, bar uh, to bark with a Harvard accent. <laughs> <laughs> and here's Admiral Byrd uh, sitting on the, um, one of the sleds. And again, going back to that newspaper thing, I'm sure all of you Facebooked what you had for lunch today, and you sent it to all your 10,000 followers or whatever they call them. Well, back then, the Boston Globe would send photographers up and hang out with uh, the gang in one lancet and here they are pi pictured making gloves and it was kind of like day after day after day in fact we're going to be in the um, boston globe like newsletter new hampshire newsletter anybody gets the boston globe and there's a new hampshire aspect of it um and so they would take pictures of them setting up the tent and they were just learning how you know the best tent they tried a bunch of different tents to find the best one that hold up um antarctica where they were going is the windiest coldest and um snowiest place on earth. So 1928, uh, let's see, what is this? 18, eight, Chinook and 18 of his sons, so 19 Chinooks, and there were uh, 90 dogs total, and Walden was 56. All right, so um, I gave you, I hope I gave you a little impression about Walden being a P.T. Barnum kind of guy. He's a very interesting guy, been doing more and more research um, uh, about all the different things that they've done. Um, and, uh, you know, his, his stories are very interesting, um, funny. On the other hand, Admiral Byrd was a modern man, a scientist, a mathematician, and his books are so boring. <laughs> I've had to read them all about Antarctica, but um, it's a good thing he went because he was like, okay, here's the... Uh, cubic inches of space in this ship and the number of dogs and the amount of dog food and the weight of wet dog food and the weight of dry dog food and all of this. Um, but, you know, it's just, it's just not fun. <laughs> so here we go. So we're leaving New England. We're going across the uh, Panama Canal and shooting over to um, New Zealand. And that's the last place where they have any Dunkin' Donuts at the time. And uh, what's really cool is whoever invented um, Antarctica did a great job of just shooting straight into a little notch that's cut into Antarctica. Um, and so that's where they were heading. And so here's the uh, cut into the notch. Now, can you see the little dashed line right there? So they want to come here to the South Pole. So this, this is the closest way to get to the South Pole. But you see this little dashed line? What does that say there? What's an ice shelf? <laughs> well, if they just could get to land, it's only 300 miles. But this ice chef adds another 500 miles. So now we're talking about 800 miles. And this is the ice shelf. So when they were leaving New Zealand and coming towards Antarctica, they saw these things. Oops, what's going on? There we go. What's that? And where does it come from? 
And where's it come from before that? Yeah, and where's it come from before that? 15,000 foot mountains. Little snowflakes. Like what we had a little earlier today. A few little snowflakes. Thousand years it takes to go from that mountain through the become a glacier and go down and go out over top of the water as an ice shelf. 500 miles of ice. And that ice doesn't stay still. And so as it's being pushed out, it cracks and there's crevices and all this kind of stuff. And the icebergs break off and float away. So this is the, the edge of the ice shelf. This is where they landed. And I've looked at this photograph. I don't see any Dunkin' Donuts there. <laughs> so here they are, up against the ice shelf. Every can of pork and beans from the bottom of that ship has to go halfway up the mast and out over, you know, because you can't, you don't want to bump up against the ice. And then down, and then the, do the dogs would carry it away. So this is, so that you can see the dogs on the very right hand side, there's dogs, dog sleds. Inside that ship, were three airplanes. So here they are unloading the airplane. They had taken the wings off and the engine out and everything and packed it in different ways. But this is uh, Admiral Byrd unloading the Floyd Bennett, which is the name of the plane, from the bowling, Eleanor Bowling, uh, which is the ship, to the barrier. Several hours after this photograph was taken, the barrier collapsed and menaced the vessel, puts the ship first. Oh, as well as the lives of a number of men. Well, isn't that boring? <laughs> If, if uh, Walden had written it, it would be something more along the lines of, Oh my God, we almost lost the ship and the people and everybody would be dead. So you see the difference. <laughs> It'd be great if Antarctica was flat. Uh, no such luck. Up and down and left and right. And so what they did is... Now, this is why you want Admiral Byrd there. He had sketched out and planned out every little bit all along. So what they did is on top of the ice and the snow, they set up their camp. The dog tunnel, as you can see, was way far away from everybody. And the Norwegians and the Swedes had to be at upper opposite ends of the camps because they used to fight. <laughs> okay, so what they did is they had all these crates and they would make these um, paths along in between the crates and they'd set them out. Then they'd cover them with wood and stuff like that and they would just wait. Snowiest place on earth. Everything is covered over by snow. So they didn't actually dig tunnels, they actually just built on top of the ice and waited for the snow to cover everything up. That's the dog tunnel. Could you imagine nine months, what that smelled like? <laughs> what it sounded like every single night. That's why the dogs were way off to the side. So these are the, these are the working dogs. That's Igloo. That is Admiral Byrd's little pet dog. I don't think he pulled a lot of freight. But he does have a book written about him. <laughs> <laughs> so this, is, uh, this whole thing was supposed to be a celebration of modern technology. People had been to the South Pole before with dog teams, but Admiral Byrd wanted to be the first one Again, that Facebook analogy, he wanted to fly over the South Pole and radio to everybody on Earth that, hey, I'm Admiral Byrd, I'm so cool, I just flew over the South Pole, no one else has ever done this before. Yeah! <laughs> Look what I had for lunch. <laughs> um, in fact, this picture was never published as far as I can tell, and, and according to legend, uh, the curator at the Bird Archive says that um, it was pulled out because they didn't want to have the dogs seen with the planes. 
They wanted this to be modern technology. The thing is, windiest, snowiest place on earth. The dogs are used to that. The dogs, <coughs> Tug was a huge dog, but he could just curl up into a little tiny ball and sit on your lap. Fur is designed, we'll talk about that in a, little, in a, in a bit, um, to protect both to shed the water and the snow and to provide warmth. There are actually two coats, like a beaver. They have an inner coat and an outer coat. So if you have um, 50 mile an hour winds, they just, you know, burrow in. They're den creatures, that's what they do. They're used to that. And we had a, uh, uh, trained our dogs to have, when we whistled like that, that meant you get a treat. And so if the dogs are, you can't even see the dogs, they might be covered totally with snow. And you go, boom, ready. Yeah, okay, we're here. 100 mile an hour winds. What happens to an airplane in 100 mile an hour winds? So they almost lost the first one. They did lose the second one. This is not going to fly. Look at that propeller. Wow. Now, believe it or not, that plane is still down there. And Admiral Byrd's great, like, great, great grandson is trying to raise money to, to bring it back and put it in a museum. Because the one we saw before, that actually did, was the one that flew over the South Pole. And that's in a museum. Now, they also brought another type of transportation. Again, they, some people said, don't bring the dogs, that's old fashioned. Just bring all these cool inventions. Anybody familiar with that? <laughs> it is. Happy holidays, everybody. <laughs> Anybody recognize this from Santa Claus is coming to town? That's what, now, uh, who can remember when Chinook was born? What year? 1917. The same year that this was patented. And where were they manufactured? Who, who invented them? Virgil White. And this is the factory. And uh, there's a club that collects the guys, that, people that collect these. And uh, they, you, you know, come in to New Hampshire every year or so. And uh, here's a friend of ours. Now, here's uh, Admiral Byrd writing in his journal that uh, there is the greatest rivalry between the crew of the snowmobile and the dog men. And remember these names. Fury and Blackie are boasting they will take the snowmobile straight on through to the pole. And then they added if the road isn't cluttered up by slow moving dog teams. I like their spirit. Them's fighting words. You don't say that to Arthur Walden and the Three Musketeers, but, uh, but they did. Uh, but Walden, uh, according to him, <laughs> knew to bide his time because he knew and trusted the dogs had been used in the, in, in the Arctic for a thousand years, you know, and, um, so anyway, so they're going out on this ice, 500 miles of ice shelf before they hit the land, and then that's another uh, 300 miles to the South Pole. So what are the dogs doing? They are, um, uh, I don't mean to insult anybody if you're a scientist, but as you, everybody else knows, scientists are extraordinarily lazy. They don't like to take their, they don't like to carry their equipment they don't like to carry the gasoline for the snowmobiles. Uh, so the dogs did. So they set out caches every 50 miles or so. And so that's what they were doing. They were the Teamsters. They weren't going to get any of the glory. They weren't going to get any scientific papers or, you know, much. And so this 500 mile um, iceberg, <laughs> ice shelf, would crack and creep and open up. And even a couple years ago, uh, University of Southern Maine um, scientist was down there and his snow, he was riding a snowmobile and crev crevasse opened up 
and he went down and he died. Um, so that's what these are. Now, how many of you have seen Snow Dogs? The Disney film Snow Dogs. So what happens is if the lead dog goes down the crevasse, the other dogs they just back up. <laughs> and vice versa, if the person goes down, then they just pull harder and get them out of the thing. What do you think happens to a snowmobile when it hits a crevasse? <laughs> There you go. That one's still down there, too. Now, so this is interesting. So Fury and Blackie were showing off with their snowmobiles. And they were saying, okay, we can, we can put out more gear caches than you can in a day. You know, why don't you just have those dogs stay at home and we'll eat them when we're hungry. So this is a photograph that's in the book, uh, and it says the end of a long hall. And it says that Strom, who's in the front with the uh, skis, uh, shouldered 40 pound knapsack, black and fury, hitched a harness to the 300 pound sled and took the trail home. <laughs> they had to hook themselves up like dogs. <laughs> Can you imagine the reception they got <laughs> when they got back to, to the base camp? <laughs> and as a result of all these, this and many other experiences, Admiral Byrd finally wrote uh, towards the end of his book that the dogs have delighted me beyond words. We can now see the wisest thing we've done was to insist upon bringing a great many dogs. He's taking credit for that too, which we were assured half the number we demanded would serve our purposes. But now with the problem unloading confronted us, we can use every one and many more for that matter. And he finally summarizes it by saying, had it not been for the dogs, our attempts to conquer the Antarctic by air must have ended in failure. Now, uh, this next part, I have documentary sources, but they contradict each other. And that is because um, Arthur Walden would tell one story to National Geographic and he told another story to uh, Scientific American. <laughs> but it's very poignant. What we do know is that, um, you know, when the weather was not so bad, they would stake the dogs out, or they were, you know, out on caches and had to spend the night. They would stake the dogs out, um, connected to a line, and According to Walden, he felt that Chinook was uh, the most obedient dog, and he um, he would take off his um, harness. And the kind of harness you, that uh, he had So on his 12th birthday, uh, Walden woke up and found that Chinook was gone. And what was left was a harness like this. And um, they call this an H harness. Anybody guess what? <laughs> the kind we use now. harness <laughs> and there's the X so these are two different kind of harnesses um, but yeah so the folklore kind of developed over the years and different stories which you know were printed so they're documented but I don't know I don't they all can't be true <laughs> um, was that as a lead dog, as the lead dog, main lead dog, Chinook was often uh, challenged by younger dogs. And he always won the fight uh, hands down, no question about it. Very dominant dog, um, except that day. And three younger dogs ganged up on him. He didn't lose the fight, but he didn't win it decisively. And people romanticized that and said, 
you know, maybe Chinook thought, well, if he wasn't going to be the lead dog, he wasn't going to follow any other dog. He wasn't going to, you know, because you know, if you're not the lead dog, the view never changes. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I just showed a couple of harnesses here, and uh, you guys can, at the end of the program, you come up here and handle them and take a look at everything. All righty. Um, so he's still running around somewhere. He's down there, too? <laughs> All right, so. You guys have a Dunkin' Donuts somewhere over the valley? Well, you're not really a town, then. <laughs> to be a town in New Hampshire, you have to have a post office, a library, and a church. So this is Juan Lance. It's, um, this is the view of how it looks now. So this is a book that uh, a friend of his wrote uh, with a teacher friend of hers about the Chinook, Chinook and his family. It's like a children's book. And this is the kennels that has the historic market now, marker now. And um, you can see here that these are not Chinooks. Uh, this is a picture, and there's the picture of the Great Chinook. It says Chinook Kennels, but it says um, Dogtown, a village of huskies. So they raised huskies and Malamutes there. And um, the person who ran it, Eva Seely, she deserves her own program. She was the first person to um, run sled dogs in the Olympics in Lake Placid in 29, or I think. 39 something and so they had uh, tours you could go on daily exhibitions and that's Eva Seely with her visit Dogtown a village of Huskies um, but the name Chinook was so famous that she was able to use that um, and of course it was a gift shop and you, know, you see Dogtown a village of Huskies now so how did we get how do we have Chinooks if they didn't raise Chinooks their Chinook kennels. And the answer is around the corner, um, Julia Lombard ran uh, Wanna Lance at Hubbard Kennels with uh, support from Mother Hubbard Dog Food Company out of Gloucester, Mass. And so they became the world only world's only breeders of Chinooks. And uh, so here they are at a dog food show or at a sports show down in Boston. And Walden continued to write books. Uh, 31, he wrote Leading a Dog's Life, Harness and Pack. And a lot of the stories uh, come from that. Very interesting. Um, and then in 1939, uh, they produced a movie called The yeah. Schnook's Children. Yeah. And you can see that on uh, YouTube again. And uh, it's posted there. And then 1940, Julie Lombard retired and she sold all of the breeding stock, 20 dogs, to Perry Green. And kind of like if you want to be um, an outfitter, or a rustic, you know, um, kind of outdoors person, you've got to have some kind of gimmicks. And so he built a log cam, but turned it into a little museum there. And he also was like a little bit of a P.T. Barnum guy. He would do um, the uh, lumberman's backhand kiss. And I do have an ax in the car if anybody wants to try that. So you take, uh, and here he is, 55 years old, and he's in Saturday Evening Post, the Joe Lewis of Axemen. So he has an 11-pound axe, and he throws up in the air, and he catches it backwards and lets it almost touch his nose. So if anybody wants to try that, I, and you want to put that on your Facebook tonight. Uh, he also did uh, canoe trips, um, again, for the Saturday Evening Post, covered this and stuff. But this is one of the pictures, and this shows the idea of the... Um, 
how loving the dogs are towards people and babies. I mean, I'm not sure I'd, I'd let a, a husky or a, um, you know, Malamute or something like that get that close to the baby. So in 1947, um, Perry Green moved from Warren to Walderboro and he built another log cabin for his, um, you know, his adventures in that little museum there. And Tug made us go there and visit him. And one of the great stories, and this again, this comes from a newsletter, the uh, Chinook News, Perry Green used to publish once a month. And he would talk about how, um, and I've seen the contracts and stuff, you know, they're on in the archives, that um, at this time, he was the world's only breeder of Chinook dog, and they'd already become famous, and so he was doing pretty good business. And um, if you wanted a Chinook at that time, you had to go there and meet with the dogs and meet with uh, Perry Green and the family, his wife, Honey. And uh, one of the things he said he did was he would invite you to come and play with the dogs in the backyard. And then he w everybody would come in to the house and Honey would bring milk and cookies. And if you asked to wash your hands after playing with the dogs and before eating cookies, you did not get a Chinook. <laughs> and also in the contract was he had the right to inspect the, uh, wherever you lived and apparently he did this a number of times and if he didn't like the way you were taking care of the dogs he could take the dog back and you didn't get a reimbursement so uh, quite a contract yeah so what ha what's going on with Walden? Well, he's still in Wanda Lancet and he's uh, retired from um, the breeding and stuff and um, March 26, 1947, there was a fire in the house and Walden pulled out his wife who was frail at the time, but he died the next day of smoke inhalation. And um, together they're buried next to the chapel in Wanda Lancet. 1963, Perry Green died and there was what we call the, the rescue of the dogs and the Guinness Book of World Records listed them for three years in a row as the rarest dog breed. Um, so here's our guy when he was a little puppy and our kids. Same year a book was published, a children's book was published. Um, in February uh, 2006, he made his sled pulling debut at the Winter Carnival. Um, so then this was 20, 2006. So we've done Winter Carnivals and stuff for a number of years there. Um, so what is the dominant uh, paternal genetics. What kind of dog was Kim? So in 2009, we did a, a DNA background study, um, I think of about 2,000 um, Chinooks at the time. And this is what we came up with. Uh, number 12 was bottom, was a Spitz Eskimo dog, obviously. Terrier, Pointer, um, Chesapeake Bay Retriever, so on and so forth. But number one was a sheep dog. But it wasn't this one. It, it, it wasn't either one of them. Not the pig or the border collie. The instinct of the border collie that we've learned to harness with whistles and words is um, prey instinct. They want to eat the sheep. That's what they're raised to do. They're raised to chase the sheep to look at them and they look this way and the sheep go that way. And the sheep by nature huddle together and herd together and that's just, you know, how it works. And it's really great. I mean, if you've ever been to the Freiburg Fair, they just, they have the sheepdog demonstration. It's amazing, you know, she whistles one way and the dog do this and do that. And they bring the sheep in through the gate and everything's just, it's amazing. So the dog go one way, the dog goes the other way. So if you look at the pictures of Kim, and the pictures of Chinook, particularly the gray Chinook, then you can see the relationship that the DNA tells us, which is that it's the Anatolian sheepdog, Anatolian shepherd dog. Anybody familiar with the Anatolians? So they're like the Pyrenees. And so here is, and you can see, kind of looks like the face of a Chinook. Um, so this is uh, in Turkey, basically. And, uh, that area. So what they do, instead of the dogs being bred and trained 
like to see the sheep as prey they actually see them as brother and sister they're brought up the little puppies are brought up in the herd and again you can see how he looks like the first picture i showed which was uh, kodiak little bear and uh but they grow up and so little brother becomes <laughs> little brother becomes big brother in fact he becomes very big brother in fact the anatolian sheepdog is one of the largest dog breeds in the world so that's where the chinooks get their size um, but again it's this loving relationship they have with everybody and so what they do is again here's here's the sheepdog and all the sheep are just kind of milling around and huddling together and eating grass and stuff and the shepherd goes and the dog comes now the sheep see him as big brother so they all follow him dozens hundreds there he is goats sheep thousands of sheep will follow a couple dogs what is the collar for three inch spikes what's in those mountains wolves bears and if anybody threatens his brothers and sisters instantly changes his behavior and very protective um, when we were uh, considering getting a dog the guy who helped us arrange it from the Chinook Owners Association we asked him now is he going to be a good um, guard dog he says guard dog what do you mean he says well you know is he going to bark when people come to the door and this and that and, uh, he said well here's how, Chinooks are great guard dogs here's how it works they will invite the robber into the house. <laughs> they, they will make him a sandwich and give him a six pack of beer. And the robber will be so full and drunk that he'll lie on the couch and fall asleep. So when you come home, there he is. You can call the police. And But no, they are very, very, uh, uh, you know, passive, calm dogs. So in 2009, the... Um, students at in a school in bedford new hampshire had heard about this story and they um, asked the legislature and governor john lynch at the time if they could make um, the chinook the state dog in new hampshire and they did so they're there so it was uh, middle school kids now so then uh as they got to be more interesting as part of the state um you know government and stuff like that the uh th there is a new hampshire folk life program and um, I don't know if you've ever heard of that, but a number of years ago, um, we worked with them to uh, develop like blacksmiths and basket makers and uh, wood decoy makers and stuff uh, to go to the Smithsonian for their National Folklife Festival. New Hampshire is a featured state. And um, so as part of that, we uh, were following what the folklore program is doing so in 2011 they did an apprenticeship program and so they wanted they recognized dog sled making in new hampshire as uh, a traditional art and this kid being a kid put all the videos on on youtube and stuff and uh but he learned from this woman uh who whose father and grandfather had made sleds and she had a whole bunch of sled equipment and everything. And um, so what she's doing is, she's very, she, she, she's passed away now, but she was a very interesting person. She would go into the uh, little restaurant cafe where um, all the loggers would go in the morning. So it opened up like at four o'clock in the morning and you know, would close, um, they, they did just serve breakfast. They didn't serve lunch, it closed like at 11. Um, and uh, she'd go in there and she'd say, I want some, I'm looking for some good ash. I want some ash and I want 10 and 16 footers and I want them in my dooryard this afternoon. And you believe me, those guys did what she said. <laughs> and so they would get good straight ash trees that uh, the Indians used to make baskets out of and she would make dog sleds uh, out of them. And I'll show you a picture in a second of one of hers. So she taught this kid how to do it. and. 
she had a lot of traditional equipment from uh, one of the three musketeers, Ed Moody. And um, so you can see how she's got a, a, a form there that she's bending, steaming the wood and bending it and then clamping it. And then when it dries, it'll stay in that shape. Um, her source of heat is a Coleman stove. And I'm sure just like you guys, every spring you go out into your backyard and you say, oh, I didn't know I still had that Chevy. <laughs> you know, because it's just been covered with snow. And so she had four or five beer kegs, empty beer kegs. I'm sure all you guys have empty beer kegs in your backyard. Um, so that's what she uses to, to steam. And this is what the finished product looks like. And uh, so there's different parts to it. And the first part is called the brush bow. And that is the part that our dogs never hit a tree or anything, but they would go around it. And then of course we would hit it. <laughs> but the brush bow would uh, sort of give you that flexibility. It's all tied together with, with rope and sinew and stuff. So uh, we've had ours fall off the uh, car going 70 miles an hour and it just bounces, you know, it doesn't break at all. It's just amazing. And then this is the diving, driving bow. And then the runners, they have a strip that you can replace. So you can pull it on gravel or whatever like that and just replace it as you need it. But uh, so there's the baskets, the part that's inside where you put your gear. The bottom of that basket is called the bed, and then the slats are what go up and down. And so it's all tied together. There's the brake and the footboard. What, what are the runners made of? Um, made out of ash. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, pretty much ash. Uh, there's a little bit of pine in the in the in the um, basket and stuff. And they're just basically born to run. It's just amazing. Um, oh, did I mention that kid that got the folk life award? He's my son. <laughs> And he kept the honor in the family, went to Northeastern, so he's a husky. <laughs> Our daughter, on the other hand, I don't know, just, you know, sometimes you get disappointments in life. So instead of staying up in the cold, my, son's, my son lives in North Conway and he's, uh, he's an engineer. And, um, you know, because he loves making things like the dog sleds and stuff. Um, but my daughter, she went to Florida and she works in manatees. <laughs> so actually I'm very proud of her too. <laughs> but uh, she doesn't do much dog sledding anymore. So uh, now we'll talk a little bit about the team and the training. And so the person who um, um, got us into this, um, you know, we had, uh, this, is, this is Tug's last harness. So one of the things that was amazing, we had a smaller harness made for him at first, and the way that, it was more teaching me how to do it, the way that you hold it is, let's see, like this. And uh, when I did something like this, Ted came right over to me and stuck his nose in. It's like, how do you know that? <laughs> and you know, then you just pull it on top of his body and, um, tie him up, hook him up to it. And uh, so we, we actually had hooked Tug up to a spare tire. And uh, he said, okay, now how do you teach him to, uh, to pull him, do all this stuff? And he says, well, you've, you've got the whistle and he'll come back, right? And I go, yeah, because we gave him a treat every time we do that. He said, the most important thing, let go. And that's all there was to it. You don't train him it's bred into the dog. Mm -hmm. You know, retrievers retrieve, pointers point, and Chinooks pull like crazy. Mm -hmm. And uh, so this is the makeup of the dog team. And uh, so Tug usually was the lead dog. And then we had another dog who was uh, kind of a mutt, um, like a um, retriever, lab retriever, black lab. Um, and so the wheel dogs, this, the lead dog has to be very aware and very obedient and um, very sensitive um, and kind of like take leadership. The wheel dogs, all they have to do is provide power. And so our dog Fenway was good at doing that. 
Uh, sometimes you'll see the little bit of the sled there. It will get frozen into the ground. And so these couple wheel dogs have to, that uh, initial pull to break free the ice and stuff like that. Um, they don't have to be the sharpest tool in the shed. And let me tell you, Fenway was not the sharpest tool in the shed, but he would, he would pull, you know, again, he would tr try to go off different angles, but he was in a harness, so he was being pulled. Um, so our, our, one of our club, we belong to a couple of different dog clubs, um, is UKC, United Kennel Club. We, we, a few years ago, we got into the AKC, American Kennel Club, and uh, when they did that, the local paper wanted to do a photo shoot, so we arranged, uh, and the other dogs are point dogs and swing dogs in the gang line. Oh, I forgot to mention. And so the line that Tug gets his name from is this line here, which is the pulling line and the Tug line. Um, so we arranged for this photo shoot and uh, you can see in this shoot how intensely the dogs are looking to run. Now that is not a dog team. That is a multiple exposure of Tug. And here he is from the side running, and look at those massive muscles in his legs, in his back legs. And he would just do that. He would just jump up in the air and just dig in with those back legs and just go. So the breed standards are the things that, uh, and Tug did win a number of these, you know, kind of like bath, uh, beauty contests, I guess. <laughs> but uh, the size and weight, you're supposed to be, um, let's see here. 20, between 23 and 27 inches, and Tug was 27 inches, and uh, 70 pounds, and that's about the average weight. Um, it's supposed to be the right color of honey gold or tawny, and our club allows any dogs that are of the Chinook descendancy, if you will, the genetic genotype, um, but they come in black all the way to white. And we say color doesn't pull the sled. We want dogs that <laughs> instinctually are bred to pull the sled. And that's what we're all about. Um, they have these wonderful markings around their nose and their eyes and kind of looks like Egyptian hieroglyphics <laughs> or makeup. And we would always joke with my daughter, did you put eyeliner on Tug this morning again? <laughs> and so here's the thing about the hair with the different outer coat and which is long hairs and the inner coat which is soft downy so it's like they're always wearing a Gore-Tex jacket they have this thing which as far as we know is only decorative but it's a shawl and kind of look like Elizabethan actors I think the tail is a saber tail and the hair is supposed to be longer to the body and then shorter at the tip of the tail and it's so funny when they do these beauty contests they come in with a micrometer and they actually, you know, measure the hairs because not only are they supposed to be longer to short, they're supposed to be like a specific ratio. <laughs> and so it's a 1.618, and that's why my email is Chinook1618, <laughs> which is the golden ratio that they used in uh, Da Vinci and Michelangelo and all like that. Uh, the feet, the feet are interesting. They're well arched and thickly pig, um, cushioned and then the toenails kind of stick out so it's like they're always wearing um, oh and they also are webbed so when Tug could go out on the ice and his toes would spread out and they were like webbed feet and so he could go on the ice and also if there was snow that was you know so high or so um, and a crust a good crust uh, he would go up and he could dance on the crust like a ballerina. It's amazing. Fenway, on the other hand, would try and get up there and he'd just go <laughs> <laughs> Again, his body, the Chinook body, is designed, they have a chest which is bigger and then their waist and their rear is smaller. So the chest is actually formed like a keel of a boat. So he could go into soft snow without a crust and just snake around like that. And Fenway would try that. He'd get in, he'd go a foot or two, and he'd 
is to have to back out. Beep, 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 beep. Because <laughs> his chest was huge and his butt was bigger. <laughs> so, remember, unless you're the lead dog, you never change. <laughs> All right, thanks so much. Uh, any um, questions uh, before we take a look at the stuff? Now, when did the, uh, the breed get recognized as a pedigree? Uh, well, UKC was something in the uh, 70s, I think it was, and the AKC was just about four or five years ago. Yeah. And did these standards that you spoke of, the, uh, the physical feature, did they, are they related to the great Chinook, how, uh, how he was built? Uh, they come actually, they're based on the standards of the dogs today. So the dogs today are generally, although there are some that look just like the Great Chinook, but the dogs are generally a smaller weight and uh, a little taller legs, and so there's a little bit differences. But they are, you know, genetically the same. And that's where you get the difference between the Chinook alikes <laughs> and the real Chinooks. <laughs> yeah. So yes. how do they come up with a sort of an idealized uh, type? It's based on today's it's sort of an average. Type. Yeah, I don't know. There's always arguments and discussions. It's We're not into that part. We just do it for the fun, for the recreation. Yeah, I mean, both our kids did some races and won the junior races once in a while. Single dog usually. Um, but it's, you know, the reason we want them again, and we had them before, is just, you know, to... to I, you know, you can't live in New Hampshire without having a sled dog, <laughs> really. Um, although, you know, you gotta, there's there's things you gotta watch about, see if I can. Uh, again, my friend taught us uh, what you should wear. So this is one of the, uh, some of the bling that you should wear when you're, going dog sledding. The longest 15 minutes of my life, we went to the north end of Shikoroa Lake. And we had been on the lake a number of times, and, um, but we wanted to, my daughter wanted to go with Tug. So she got a headlamp on, and we went down to the bridge, which is about a mile away, and um, we could see her leave and we had a cell phone of course she got out in the middle of the lake and the cell phone no reception and all of a sudden the light turns and we couldn't see it and we I mean I just like lost it and uh, she's it seemed like minutes but it was probably only seconds we saw the light again and she came in and we said what happened she said I don't know I don't know um, so again, our friend had told us to have this in case. You see the spikes? So if she went into the water, she could pull herself out. And um, so we went there the next day to see what was going on. And again, this is the thing about the instinct of the dogs. Even though it was dark, there was somebody who had cut a fishing hole in that area. And we're like, somehow either you know, pads on his feet or something, he knew there was a hole there and he just went around it. We should have trusted him, but uh, you know, it's just, it's well, just amazing. Fishermen are, fishermen are supposed to put something in those. They are holes. supposed to, but they don't, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I have a question about sure. pads. Yes. Um, I've been out with dogs in the snow and they get all the hair in yeah. between, they, the balls get all stuck, yeah. and they can't walk. Yeah. I didn't notice a lot of hair between. No, no, they, um, again, that is, you know, and again, I don't know how you breed a dog and how you say you're going to want to get this feature and that feature, yeah. but no, they, they don't seem to do that. Um, and most of the dog, most of the Chinooks I know hate those booties. We tried yeah. getting <laughs> Tug and he just would sit down and start chewing on it <laughs> um but no that, that, i know what you mean though that is a problem with a lot of yeah. sled dogs but not so much chinooks yes yeah early on they spelled sled s yes l e d g e sled 
Yes. yes. Yeah. That's the. Well, it hasn't. That's the British uh, version. So, like yeah. center and you know different words. Um, yeah. 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 Uh, it, it, it goes up and down. Um, they are all on the website, Chinook Owners Association, and there actually is a map there that can show you, um, you know, the closest ones and stuff like that. And they, we have a puppy page, so you can see the, the new litters. I just, I just oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. 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 It, it, it's, we don't have any controls over the number. We just have controls over, you know, making sure they're real Chinooks. Yeah, because there, there are people who will try and pass off a shepherd or something, mix it. Yeah. Are there any chronic health problems that are uh, 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 yeah. common in the breed, like dysplasia? Yeah, dysplasia, like um, eye problems. Uh, being large dogs, they also have uh, potential health uh, heart problems. So what we do is we have a, um, that's part of why we do the breeding in such a careful manner, is um, to make sure that all dogs have to be tested before they can breed. And um, so pretty much under control, yeah. But, but it, is, it is a potential problem. Do you have an average life expectancy that you can? Yeah, 15 years. Oh, that's yeah. pretty good for a big dog. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and again, I think part of it is that they just, um, you know, uh, are that kind of active dog, but at the same time, they'll sit on the couch and eat cheeseburgers and <laughs> stuff, you know, like as they jump on you. Oh, in fact, I gotta tell you this one story. So, Tug used to sit on this one spot on the couch, and Fenway, you know, being stupid, um, just sat there one day. And um, Tug didn't get upset or anything, he went and he got Fenway's favorite toy. And he came and he sat right in front of him and he was like, <laughs> toy, toy, toy. And Fenway got off the couch, Tug dropped the toy, Fenway grabbed the toy, turned around, and there's Tug on the couch. <laughs> and we saw that and we're like, Smart we're like, did that, did that just happen? Did that really happen? But. We thought, well, that's got to be a one-off, but it wasn't. It was like the next night, it did the same thing, and Fenway never, <laughs> never figured it out. <laughs> Lovable dog, but boy, dumb as a bucket of rocks. I have to listen to the name real quick. I'm sorry yeah. if you mentioned that. Oh, it's okay. Going, um, the military helicopter, Chinook? Yes. Is there a relationship yes. uh, there? Yes, uh, 68, I think it was, uh, there was a Chinook uh, named Charger, and he was a mascot for, uh, in Vietnam, when they did the, um, when those uh, helicopters were introduced. Yeah. And again, it's because they're not Blackhawks. They're not fast, they're not aggressive. They're carriers, they're Teamsters. You know the Chinook helicopters are, you know, support, and that's that's what the that's what the history of the Chinooks have mostly been. I mean, they've won races and stuff. But, um, you know, they're not the fastest dog anymore. Yes. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. We we have throughout the whole day. It's a usually starts with the one dog. Um, you know, and, and the, the driver can only be like 15. But I mean, you get six and eight year olds that go out on the short sprint with the one dog. Um, and then, then there's like a, um, what do you call it? A, you know, an unlimited number um, that's, uh, and they race like timed races, you know, so it's not like everybody line up and go. It's like one team goes out and they. What's the longer? Uh, well, I've seen 16. That's the biggest I've ever seen. Yeah, in fact, we actually had a, I think it was a 16 that, um, <laughs> speaking of, it was down in Wagon Wheel Farm near Durham, and uh, it was a grass during the summer race. 
Um, well, it really wasn't a race. It was more of a just playing around. And uh, we brought Tug. It was the first time we was was with this. There's like regional groups. First time we were with this, this group. And Tug just saunters up to the front, and they start growling at him. So he backs up a couple and growling. Backed up. It was about fifth. <laughs> you know, and so if you saw the movie Snow Dogs, that's kind of what it is. You don't, you don't mess with that. You just let them figure it out, and they'll growl and sneer, and and pretty much they they all accept it. It's like okay, well, okay. It, it, it's it's magical to be honest. It's just magical to watch these, and when they when they're at the race. Um, one of the things I like is actually, I like watching the race start, but I actually like going to the crossroads back in the woods where, you know, the logging roads are, and they're going along those. Um, because when they start, a, how, many, how many of you ever seen a race? One of the things that I think is so cool is they're barking and jumping and snarling. And then when that flag goes down, absolute silence. And it's just whoosh. And that's the way it is when they're back in the woods. You just hear this shoom. <laughs> and it's just so exciting. It's thrilling, you know. Well, thank you so, so much. Yeah, it's really you. great to hear about the dog and your enjoyment of it and how much they inspire in, in our hearts. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. 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 Thank you.